the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Now, we had a good day today. We talked about a lot of interesting stuff, and uh, you know, there's a lot of jawboning going on, and, and these are folks who like to talk. And poor Ron, it was like he was herding a room full of cats, <laughs> trying to keep people going. But the, the, the subject was interesting, and it, and it boils down to this. Uh, the large media organizations are, most of the country is owned by about five companies. And if you add everything else, it's about eight companies that own everything. So there are, are eight CEOs who have enormous power in this country over what you see and what you hear and the information you receive. And it is because of the internet that that power has begun to break apart. Now that's ordinarily, in ordinary circumstances, interesting, challenging. But in these times, when we are faced with the magnitude of crises that we are looking at, it is more than interesting, it is absolutely imperative that we begin to look at ways that we have workarounds, we begin to look at ways that we find uh, new and important information that's available to us. We have challenges, as UCSB has uh, been uh, pointing out over the past couple of months here, challenges in the environmental area which are truly daunting. And unless we are able to put our arms around them and move forward, uh, we're gonna be in a, in a lot of trouble. Everybody knows that the Iraq war and our foreign policy is, is also a daunting problem. We know that we're bankrupt. Paul Krugman says essentially the American economy now is uh, composed of borrowing from China and selling each other houses. And, uh, you know, I don't think he's kidding, honestly. <laughs> he's pretty serious about the whole thing. So these are the problems that we're facing. And um, on the media, <clears throat> I can tell you everything you want to know about Anna Nicole Smith. Uh, I know who her, the father of her child is, and I know where the child is now. It's because I can see it on any given night but you don't hear about these important issues. However, if you go to the digital media, you do. And you hear about them in a powerful way. Now, uh, Ron is right, I'm a critic of, of the traditional media and I've worked in the traditional media for decades. Over the past six years, we have seen a failure of the traditional media to live up to their responsibilities of oversight and challenging the government, greater than any we have known in the nation's history. They have remained silent in the face of any number of things that we're going to be hearing about, are hearing about now, and it is my belief that those, those in the traditional media who have not yet come to feel ashamed will feel ashamed of, of their performance and their letting down the American people. That means that the, the internet, that means that the people who are struggling on their own often with very few dollars to find new ways to approach uh, getting this information out, it has become of, of extreme importance. And we're seeing some really exciting things happen. I mean, I go to a website called Fire Dog Lake. And, you know, these websites are, they're, they're kind of saucy. They don't, they don't follow the traditional uh, pulling the forelock when dealing with power. And Fire Dog Lake is composed of some very smart lawyers. And they, they used to be just talkers, and eventually they became really great researchers, particularly on the Lewis Libby case, which was the Joseph Wilson case. I guess you probably all know about that. 
and they applied for uh, um, press passes at the trial, and they were the only journalists to live blog from the trial. So if you wanted to know what was happening inside the Lewis Libby trial, you had to go to Fire Dog Lake. And then they had an incredibly in-depth presentation later on, an analysis of what had happened. I would read the New York Times. After I had read that, the New York Times would always be far behind them. Uh, that's powerful. And in other areas, it's incredibly powerful. Now, I know that Gunther is here tonight. I thought the opening act was going to be Lonely Girl 15, but apparently not. And when you see what's happening on YouTube, you all know that Gunther is a YouTube act. And uh, what happens on YouTube is really amazing, because it happens with viral marketing or no marketing at all. Does everybody know what beatboxing is? Raise your hand if you don't know what beatboxing is. All the old guys don't know what beatboxing is. OK, it's, it's basically rapping without words. And it's just making sounds like <laughs> stuff like that. I'll be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so there was a guy in, in Lithuania or someplace who uh, did this in his garage, and he, and he put it all together. It was a pretty, pretty funny video, about two and a half minutes. And he, all he did was put it up on YouTube. And uh, there's an algorithm in YouTube, and people began looking at it, and it got pushed up, and then it became incredibly popular. And it was so funny that the BBC got hold of it. And they put it on BBC, and then it got into the American networks. By the time it was over, something like 45 to 50 million people had seen this guy from Lithuania. And I assume he had a contract with Sony shortly thereafter. This is why Gunther is such a big deal. We all know that George Allen uh, is no longer senator because George Allen got his video of uh, the Makaka video, which is now a very famous video, notorious video, uh, posted on YouTube, only because it was posted on YouTube. An entire... If that had not been posted on YouTube, the Senate would today be controlled by the Republicans. That's how powerful that is. And we're already seeing what's going to happen in the 2008 election. A guy who, who sat in his, he talked about it, he said he was sitting in his house and said, yeah, I started fooling around, and put together a commercial. It's, the, it's now the notorious Hillary Clinton commercial. Has everybody seen that? Do I need to describe it? That's the Apple 1984 commercial, if you haven't seen it, but with Hillary instead of uh, Big Brother. And it played right into the idea that Hillary's this big democratic machine. It's been seen by gazillions of people, and it's going to have an influence on this election. This is going to be the first internet election in history, bigger than 2006 by far. That's how powerful this is, and that's how quickly things are moving forward. So what we want to talk about tonight is that transition, that moment that we're sitting in, this point of inflection, the tipping point, that where we're beginning to see that power is shifting from the hands of those very few people who have long enjoyed power and, frankly, tonight still expect to continue enjoying power to what I believe is going to happen, and that's going to be a true revolution in media where the power shifts in truly democratic form to the hands of millions of people. Increasingly, power is in your hands. You can affect change in a way that has never been possible before. And given what is in front of us, if we do not take that power in our hands, then it will be our shame that we're going to have to deal with. This country is at a point of great decision. And there are more and more people who are rising up and beginning to bring their voice to it. Now, what is exciting about this is that we started this conversation really around the UCTV system. We were talking about what UCTV is. And one of the things that I, that I heard was that, you know, we're, we're kind of small and we're kind of poor here at UCTV. And then I started hearing what they did. Well, we only got 15 million households. And I, what, we've got 700 videos a year or something like that that you, you crank out. And we're only at 24 our seven-day-a-week channel, and we're only the entire 10 uh, universities of the UC system, so we're, we're not so good, and I don't want to hear it. There are people who are working on the internet and are having a powerful effect who would kill for that distribution before they even got started. So the UC TV system is positioned to have great 
impact, not only in the state of California, not only in the nation uh, that, that we so love, but throughout the world. It is just a question of finding the right formula and making it work. And that's what we were talking about today. Um, let me just close by, by talking about a man that I admired, a man named Théo de Chardin, who was a priest. Uh, he was a priest in the middle of the 20th century. And Théo de Chardin was a kind of visionary. And he looked around at what was the beginning of television and this radio which was going worldwide and so on, and he said, you know what I believe is happening? I believe a noosphere is being formed. That's a word that he coined. And by noosphere, what he meant was that the entire planet was developing a central nervous system. The entire planet was awakening. And it, it is ideas that were sweeping around the globe. And the central nervous system of the planet, in Teilhard's mind, was the human race. We were the Earth awakening. The challenge that we face is that our awakening comes at great cost to the planet. And so we're, we're in a race. Will we get to the point where we are aware enough that we begin to take care and not act as little children? And the only way that we will do that is if this Noah's fear forms and if our ideas become much richer and deeper and much more intelligent than they have been so far. We will have to become something more and better than we have been. And that, frankly, has been the course of the human race. We have, we have grown into wisdom. And now we stand at that point of choice, which is really what all these folks are going to be talking about. They'll be talking about all the little choices and decisions and things that we're facing. But really, it's that great, large question that hangs over us. Will we choose to be more, or will we fall back? because there are no other alternatives than those. So as Ron pointed out, uh, our folks, let me ask these, the first panel to come on up here and, and get wired up. Where are you folks? Don't be afraid. And they're going to uh, kick some ideas around. And then, and then uh, we're going to ask them some questions. Now, uh, we have two microphones here, so just raise your hand if you have a question that you would like to ask. And I only urge you to ask the meanest question that you possibly can. Because these guys have, are tough and they can handle it. The first panel, and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves, are the implications and examples of using new media for community and for cultural benefit. They've been thinking about it all day. And ladies and gentlemen, we begin. Good evening. My name is Richard Somerset Ward. I'm a senior fellow of the Benton Foundation, which is a, a Washington think tank on media policy and the public interest. I've been in broadcasting all my life, which, as you can see, is a long one. Uh, and I began it with the BBC, uh, for whom I worked for 20 years. I came to this country uh, in the middle 70s. I've lived here ever since. And uh, I love it. And I have become passionately involved over the years in some of the things that Forrest has been talking to us about. And one of those is community broadband networks. And that's one of the subjects that we've addressed today and which we'll come back to in a minute. Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Robinson, and um, I work here on campus, running the campus radio station, which is an Associated Students um, activity, I guess, is as, as much as a good word as any. And in addition to what I do there, including producing programs and producing uh, a public access television program, I work for an international organization called AMARC. It's the French acronym of the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters. And we work to uh, give people voice all over the world, to give them access to media, uh, primarily radio, because that's what most people have access to. And um, in that regard, we have mostly very, very poor, truly very poor uh, radio stations that have very often not even uh, an infrastructure, an, electri an electrical grid system, et cetera. And so we rely on 
among other things, the internet to deliver uh, information and to receive information at hubs that then is dispersed by radio. And I think that's enough. Uh, my name is Dan Gilmore. I'm uh, currently director of the uh, Center for Citizen Media, which is a uh, tiny little uh, nonprofit affiliated with the uh, UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Uh, I'm focused in particular uh, not just on people creating their own media, but in, uh, especially in the area where it intersects with journalism, because uh, I spent 25 years almost in the professional journalism world, and uh, I'm pretty sure that we're watching the unraveling of one kind of business, or several kinds of businesses in journalism today. And uh, I want to try and help get through this transition into a place where we end up with a more diverse and vibrant and valuable journalistic ecosystem. And uh, I suspect that with a little bit of uh, careful uh, guidance now, not that anyone can tell anyone how to or what they must do in creating media, but I think if we help people do it well and do it honorably, we're going to end up with that better form of journalism in the future. Well, let me uh, outline some of our discussions today um, and the others, because they are argumentative folks, will interrupt me and put me right if I go wrong. Um, we really took up the argument, I think, uh, exactly where Forrest stated it just now, which is that the narrowness of media ownership in this country is now so great. In other words, there are so few owning so much that it seems to us terribly important, I would say desperately important, that those outlets that are owned and operated within communities should think very hard and long about what directions they're going to go in and how they're going to operate. And clearly, UCTV is a classic example of that. Communities can be anything from small hamlets to whole states, but Clearly, a community like a university, and especially a university that has 10 campuses, each of which is a community within the larger community, uh, commands a great deal of respect. It also seemed to us that a university has so many resources of expertise, of people, and I hope those who come under this heading won't think that I'm making fun of them if I refer to them as geeks, because I deeply respect them, uh, a damn sight more than jocks on the whole, um, and many, many other resources uh, contained in a university that when combined with, partnered with communities can make for a very remarkable uh, piece of democratic equipment for a community. We live in an age where communities have gradually, because of television partly, um, been stripped of their old powers, power just to live so well within a community, to be a part of a community. Now I think these new technologies bring that back with the chance to create broadband communities, to use this wonderfully flexible technology to aid a community, to assist a community, to inform a community, to help members of the community participate, and to provide services to all the members of the community. It is a, 
a remarkable thing. We've never seen anything like it, certainly in my lifetime. And to let it drift away into some sort of private ownership or um, into the way that the traditional media have gone, because I do agree with Forrest that I think they have a lot to answer for at the moment. I think that would be a sin, no less. So that is the sort of the large picture that we discussed uh, during the day. And I'll let um, Elizabeth and, and the others take up some of the individual uh, subjects within that. Um, but it all relates in the end to what UCTV can be and we desperately hope will be. I think we want to be brief because we really do want to engage here, but the, I think for me one of the challenges as far as UCTV is concerned is the same challenge which uh, faces the university and that's a decision as to whether or not uh, it wants to be predominantly an elitist institution or whether it wants to be open. And I think a lot of what we talked about today had to do with uh, a kind of social responsibility to move towards openness. We will always have uh, plenty of stellar content, but how do we also make it open to people who uh, are not on faculties or who are not researchers, et cetera. And so for me, that's a, certainly a critical piece. It concerns me when I know that we are producing in the state more students than the university can accommodate who are university eligible. Um, and it would concern me that whatever, if whatever we imagine for UC TV was uh, likewise inadequate. So I think rather than uh, say anything more than that, I would just say I hope that there's spaces for students. Uh, I hope there's spaces uh, and the imagination to use uh, other channels, to use the web, et cetera, uh, to make it um, something that all of the citizens of the state, at the very least, own. Uh, very briefly. One thing, communities uh, which can be uh, communities of interest as well as geography, and often are with technology that we use today. One thing that communities have in, col in common if they are actual communities is conversation. And media of the past half century have been largely, traditional media have been largely a lecture. Uh, and as media evolve into a more conversational form, which I think is essential and valuable, I, I just hope that everyone involved will remember what the first rule uh, of a conversation is, and, and that's to listen. And I'm going to stop. frankly, uh, more important than what these folks, because I've heard what they had to say. So uh, I urge anybody just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. In, in the meantime, I will uh, harass people who are, who are here. Uh, Len, you are UCTV. You've heard what they've had to say. Um, can we get a microphone, somebody? Yep. There's one of the microphones. Another one is here. So raise your hands if you want to talk. What's the uh, mandate of UCTV? And when we say that using uh, new media for community and cultural benefit is a good, what do you mean by that? I love putting people on the spot. <laughs> the mandate of UCTV is to, um, in part, take the knowledge that's generated um, on our campuses and around our campuses and make it available to a wider um, group of people than are only the people that, that are partaking in either a formal or informal education on the campus itself. So take that knowledge, that information, and spread it more widely. Okay. Um, that's been the mandate so far, but here's a question for, how many students we got here? 
students. How many of you believe that UCTV, which is a, a, a university asset, should be, uh, Gunther is here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, should be used to reach out beyond the bounds of the university system? And how many of you think that it should be used uh, for university students and for university faculty so that it should be sort of within a walled garden of the university? You're talking about some of the work that you do. Could I ask you that question? Go on up here to the microphone. There you go. You're, you're, you're studying a specific area of psychology that has to do with this, right? Uh, cognitive psychology, that's correct. Um, to be honest, I've never watched UCTV, so I have no idea. Um, well, imagine that you had. Well, <laughs> I, I assume that uh, it would probably be most appropriate to reach out to the community. I mean, it seems like the um, liaison between the university and the community is a very important thing since the community is funding the university. So the community should know what we're doing, know what we're all about, how we're spending their tax money. At present, it is taking programs like this, which they're videotaping, and putting them on television, right? And then it's also available online. We've been talking about the kind of flexibility of, of the internet. So if they reach out to the, to the uh, community, can you think of other ways that you think would be valuable in, in providing that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm just curious. No, no, no. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, how to, how to reach out to the community? You know, it's on TV. It's long-form programs on TV. But on the internet, you can do anything you want. You use the internet a lot. Yeah, that's why I don't watch TV very much. Okay. And, I, and actually, that I do have a question regarding to that. If, if knock us out. You, okay. Go ahead. Well, um, you actually mentioned earlier um, viewership, and uh, how much viewership UCTV has in the different networks. And I'm curious how much of a relevant factor that is, because I hardly watch TV to get my news anymore at all. I go to Google, I Google it, and I read wherever I find the news. And to give a recent example of that, I, I first read about the Virginia Tech shootings um, through an uh, online Australian newspaper that I found in Google. And so I'm curious how, what you think, how that's going to affect viewership in the future. I mean, if that's going to be a relevant factor or not. Uh, Connie, you're shaking your head. You're on the board. You want to take that? There's a microphone right here, I think. I think that, uh, I think that that's precisely uh, uh, what our next panelists, uh, who are uh, very much wanting to talk about uh, how uh, there is UCTV television. There's also UCTV streaming uh, uh, on the net. There's also uh, Google Video carrying UCTV. Uh, but we have uh, uh, talked uh, earlier this afternoon uh, about all of the ways in which uh, UCTV uh, needs to have uh, a presence. Uh, it needs to be able to be highly interactive uh, if we are ever going to be able to think of it as a community. Dan, you work in this area. Well. I find myself a little bit at a loss as on, on this question because where UCTV ought to be really depends on what it thinks it is and what the people who create it think it should look like uh, 10 years from now as opposed to today. And I, I, it, my sense of it is that it's very much traditional media in its current form, even though it's being distributed through a couple of non-traditional uh, formats, which are rapidly becoming standard for the way people look at media. But it's still very top-down in a sense, and it's still uh, very much uh, created uh, by this group that puts it out for the world. And I, I just hope to see using these technologies that are conversational in nature and understanding that all of the innovation going on is being done by people out at the edges of networks, not the people in the center, that uh, there's a lot of experimenting that could be done with this and that will challenge the, uh, the top-down model in a powerful way and is going to create big challenges for uh, the governance 
of, of this system as well as its actual content. But I hope in the end that a lot of what you call content will be very much a conversation with the people who want to be part of it through other means. Yes, I, I think that we're kind of feeling our way towards something that doesn't exist at the moment and that we believe needs to exist. And that's why it's so difficult to describe to you. The nearest thing that I know of in this country, or actually any country, to what I'm talking about, a broadband community network, is in Cleveland, northeastern Ohio. And there, a community has created a broadband network for itself, which is an extraordinarily efficient and powerful backbone for that community and binds it together and is in the process of binding it together in a very remarkable way. It is a broadband network that is composed of a fiber backbone which lay there in the earth unused from the 1970s when all that cable was laid and it was what is called dark fiber because it wasn't being used. It's been lit up and used now as the backbone uh, to this whole community. It connects all the major institutions, the government of Cleveland, the public schools, the universities, all the major resources uh, of the city, the cultural institutions and so on. And over that, they are laying um, a Wi-Fi bed, a wireless bed, which provides the last mile access to every home. So you have there a broadband engine, and that's great. That is what the technicians thought up and put in place. But the question is how to use it and what to use it for, and what use will it have? And that is what is happening at the moment. And it is becoming very effective in some areas, most notably healthcare. The Cleveland Clinic, which is a major part of it, has put $10 million into it in order to ensure that uh, interactive uh, healthcare education programs are done for every classroom in Cleveland every semester. Uh, it's becoming very effective in terms of democracy, a tool for the government of the, uh, the cities to use uh, to alert citizens, to keep citizens informed, to make for a town hall democracy. It's been effective in many different ways, but it's only the very beginning of it, because they are now inventing new ways to use it. But what I wanted to say is most important about it for UCTV is that the convener of that organization was a university. Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And it was really one guy within that, the chief information officer, a man called Lev Gonick, who acted as the convener, who went to the other institutions, talked to them, explained what his vision was and how they could achieve it. You have to have an institution and people at the center of something like this who are trusted and who are worthy of the trust of a community. A university is a tremendous resource. It has wonderful expertise. It has an enormous number of resources I've talked about a little bit already, including geeks. And it can do wonderful things for a community. And now the tool is to hand. And that's why I hope UCTV will use it. I'm sorry I've gone on, but I am passionate about it. Uh, that was really interesting, actually. Um, my background is in sustainable practices, and um, one of the little-known facts I'd heard about is that municipalities are entitled to create broadband networks for themselves, and meaning instead of having a cable company do it. So a municipal utility, a city's municipal utility, could actually do this. And one of the potential benefits then is revenue for the city that's creating that, that could be shared with hospitals and schools and so on. Um, so I was just curious if this is a, 
I don't know exactly how to say it, if they're the generator of the broadband network um, in this town then, um, that they're applying they're pl this kind of thing that's having the benefit for the participants and also for the town itself. So the dollars are staying in the town too. Do, do any of our panelists know about what the city of uh, Santa Barbara is doing specifically? Elizabeth, do you? I think probably Guy knows more than I do. Okay. Doc, no. <laughs> take, it, take it away, Doc. <laughs> what are we doing with the broadband initiative? Oh, here in Santa Barbara. Um, and with yeah, a microphone. Sure. I just thought I'd speak loudly. Um, okay. Stand up. Okay. I have to stand up for what we're doing. Um, uh, there's been an informal broadband initiative going on in Santa Barbara for, for some time. Uh, Guy's been involved in it. Uh, Kevin Barron. Kevin, are you here by any chance? Uh, he's with KATP here at, uh, at UCSB. It's uh, another one of the organizations here. Um, the idea is to get uh, fiber to the home and, uh, and wireless surrounding that here in Santa Barbara. And uh, to basically to do what was done in Youngstown. We haven't explored putting the university at the center of that. Um, there's a geographical consideration in that UCSB is not actually in Santa Barbara. Um, it's in Santa Barbara County. The county and the city uh, are really very separate entities. Um, and so there are political considerations there as well as geographical ones. Um, but it is underway, and if anybody wants to uh, talk to me or, 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 or guy about it, uh, uh, feel free. There's a, I, I, we're reasonably optimistic that we can make something happen. Um, unlike some other municipalities uh, or regional efforts, um, we're not seeking to do um, uh, what a lot of the carriers uh, will characterize as government versus uh, business. We actually do want uh, private-public partnerships to make something happen here. But the interesting thing is that the, the highest cost for bringing fiber to premises or fiber to homes is about $2,000 uh, uh, a drop, $2,000 a house. That may sound like an awful lot of money, especially when you add it up, but that's about the price you're going to pay for really good large screen TV at Costco that's going to be worth nothing in three years. And, and, it, and a fiber connection to a house essentially puts an infinite lane highway for information that goes two ways directly into, uh, in, into anybody's household. And what's going to happen in the future is anybody is in a position to produce as well as consume. Uh, what Forrest talked about in the first place is, is, is critically important. That anybody can produce as well as consume. Anybody can be a participant in the community culture that we're hearing about and you know, in much more. So it's something that we've, it's, it's not a formal thing, but it's been something I've been working on for some time and it's making some progress. Elizabeth, you, you, you work with community radio and you care tremendously about community, so let me give you the last word on this topic before we move on. Okay, I'd like to maybe do it as, as a radio skeptic a little bit. No skepticism about your comments vis-a-vis uh, -vis the corporate media or the mainstream media. We definitely need ways around that, and, and um, I am certainly not naysaying the broadband or the internet is a way to do that. But what I think we need to be a little circumspect about, if not absolutely cautious, is that um, technological leaps tend to leave a lot of people behind, and we need to be very careful that we're not uh, exacerbating that. And let me give you one example that has nothing to do with the broadband, but has to do with telephony. Um, on this campus and in cities all over the place, uh, public telephones are being pulled out as no longer necessary. But if you go into poor neighborhoods where there still are some, you'll find people lined up waiting to use telephones. Not everybody has a cell phone, but we act as though they do. And I think it's extremely important that we think about um, things like whatever kind of distribution that relies on uh, that um, broadband or uh, high-speed delivery uh, to be clear that we're bringing along people that need to be brought along, that we're not creating, not, we're not leaving people behind. And in some sense, it's probably inevitable. It's happened with every uh, form of media that we can think of. Writing left all of the non-literate behind. You know, they're all kind of esoteric, but we have the capacity to try to approach them differently. And I think the responsibility to do that. 
Let me thank all three of you, and if I could ask you to uh, pass your microphones on to the next panel. Uh, it's interesting, I mean, telephony is an interesting question, because there's a fellow named Bino Kosla who works with Kleiner Perkins uh, up in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, or did work with him. He started his own venture capital firm. And he's, along with some others, started microloans. Uh, and one of the ways that, th that they did microloans was going to the a nation of India and going to small villages that had no telephones and giving uh, almost always women in, in the village, by the way, because women tended to be better shepherds of the money and better uh, business people. I'm not sure why. But loaning someone the money to buy a cell phone. And that cell phone became a business. It actually helped the community that there was no, I mean, I'm not suggesting that's the right thing to do, but it helped this community that there was no telephone because it was a business that was able to be started and the money stayed inside the community. So it became a, a whole process that we're seeing now with microloans throughout the developing nations, and that's an exciting thing. Our uh, next three panelists uh, will introduce themselves, if you would, and they're talking about the challenges not only uh, about distribution but for producing. So if you don't have a lot of money, uh, how are you able to produce the kind of quality and across multiple platforms that we need to do in the new world? Lady and gentlemen. And she's not. Thank you. Um, my name is Sharmini Pires. Um, I'm the executive director of the editorial board and policy and development of that at the Independent World Television, The Real News. Um, we are a new television venture, which is not for profit. Um, without government funding, commercial funding, advertising. We are basically a viewer-funded model that is international and global in scope, and we hope to be um, the globalization from below, so to speak, um, which is uh, essentially a news network, an anecdote, uh, as Mr. Blossom said this morning, um, uh, to the network news. Um, we are a news network that hopes to be competing with uh, the likes of CNN and BBC by 2020. So we have high hopes. And uh, the CEO of the network always said, we're gonna go big or go home. So uh, <laughs> with that spirit, um, I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of restate something that Forrester said earlier, which is that we are faced with unprecedented concentration of power. He basically said there's um, eight CEOs you know, deciding what, what we see and hear um, on the mainstream media. Um, I think we can't stop there. The concentration of power uh, is much more. The political concentration in this world is unprecedented as well. Um, if you recall, or maybe you won't recall, because none of the networks actually carried this, or newspapers for that matter, but days before the uh, Iraq war, when the Iraq war was imminent and the Security Council was moving closer and closer in terms of weapons of mass destruction, the old uh, non-aligned movement uh, from <laughs> way back when, um, which is basically 120 countries of 192 at the United Nations, uh, led by South Africa at the time. And Becky wrote to the president of the UN calling for a emergency general assembly meeting to discuss the war in Iraq because they didn't like the decision that the Security Council was moving towards. Um, in spite of that, um, these countries were not heard. Uh, the U.S. immediately dispatched uh, uh, special envoys to every capital city in the world that were members of the U.N. to suppress that request, and they succeeded. So this concentration of uh, political power isn't just in the United States. It is a dominance in the world. Um, that kind of threat, that kind of silencing of the smaller countries of this world is another form of concentration of power, not to mention economic power of multinational corporations um, that own the media as well. So we have organizations or corporations like GE 
um, not only do they make light bulbs, they have nuclear power plants. They're a part of the military industrial complex. Um, they own uh, uh, media, they own uh, television networks, and on and on and on, newspapers, print, etc. So the concentration of power in this world at the moment is much greater than one can imagine. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, reminded of the US, the film, The Network, and I feel like we should all be out there with Gunther screaming, we are mad as hell and we're not gonna take it anymore. Um, and uh, and I, th I think that's, that's the state we are, we are at in the world. But, uh, but it's not all gloom and doom. Um, there is hope, and, and as I heard today, while such you know, brilliance were concentrated in, in, in this uh, workshop, that all of the new media that is out there and the, all the ways in which media can be used in order to democratize and actually give people access to access and voice and power and, uh, and, uh, and it has the democratizing effect of the new media gives us great hope. And, uh, and I think it's a matter of seizing that uh, power, harnessing that power and, and using it to, to mobilize the world. So, gentlemen, if I could you. ask you to just pause two things. Uh, first of all, I, I thought, I didn't realize Network was a movie, I thought it was a documentary. <laughs> and uh, second, we have a distinguished visitor that we would uh, like to acknowledge. Sorry, but I uh, would like to acknowledge uh, our Chancellor Henry Yang and his wife Dilling in the back. And we're, we're very pleased he's here. He's very busy. He was only able to come, but he really wanted to come here. And he specifically said he wanted to come to see you. Oh. And I also thank him and the deans and uh, the university for supporting the center and for supporting UCTV to the extent they support them. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And while we're talking about concentration of power, here's Martin Sansing. I, um, my name is Martin Sansing. I work as a director of programming uh, for UVerse Television at AT&T. And UVerse Television is our answer to cable TV delivered through the phone network. So now we can uh, compete head to head with them with the, the full triple play or uh, broadband phone and uh, television. Um, wanted to one thing to point out about our, our television service. It's uh, using IPTV technology uh, or Internet Protocol television technology. We're the first company to deploy that in uh, large scale in the United States. It is used overseas in some areas. Um, there are a number of implications of, of the use of IPTV. Uh, today, our, our service resembles uh, our competitors on satellite and cable, but uh, IPTV has the opportunity to open up uh, content. It is essentially internet technology and can be used as a pipe for programming that's available on the internet to get that to the television um, and really bridge those worlds. The uh, couple other interesting facts about it, it's, um, it's not a, a broadcast model in the conventional sense. It's, it's truly each household or each set-top box uh, gets its own unique feed, which um, enables you to, to target programming uh, and really uh, differentiate what you offer on, a, on even a potentially an individual level. Um, it uh, also has some interesting implications in terms of we, we can see what every person is watching, which really, uh, during the workshop today, we talked about the, the weakness of Nielsen ratings, but uh, with, uh, no, with this kind of information, you can use it to really understand uh, what, how programming is resonating with viewers and hopefully improve it, um, as well as uh, by combining that with consumer data target uh, programming to them. So. My name is Guy Smith, and <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the Bush administration, uh, nor the uh, industrial complex down here at the other end of the table. Um, I'm the dean of the School of Media Arts at Santa Barbara City College. We have a robust and vibrant uh, program in digital media. We teach everything from interface design, web, uh, uh, animation, uh, film and television production, uh, and we have just uh, launched, or are in the process of launching, two major initiatives, one in uh, serious game development, and uh, that's using game technologies, MMOs, for 
uh, serious business rather than educational endeavors rather than entertainment. And the other one we have is we have two uh, sizable grants to develop curriculum based on what we see as a new and emerging medium, and that is the, for the mobile phones and mobile devices. And <clears throat> I think if you look back over the 20th century, um, as the new medium emerges, it ch changes in shapes of the existing media that's there. This is true for what happened with radio and newspapers, and the television came out, it reshaped uh, radio and reshaped the movies. And, and it was also, every time a new medium comes along, it's uh, accompanied by uh, proclamations of the death of the old media. And what happens is it reshapes the existing media. And um, I think that you're going to see a lot that happens uh, relative to mobile media here in the next uh, two to three years. This book that was passed out today, The Next Generation Media, The Global Shift by Richard Adler, states, the largest technological impact globally is coming from the mobile phone. So uh, I can tell you I've spent the last two years poking around at trade shows, uh, interviewing people in Hollywood, and uh, people are really trying to figure out what is the killer app for mobile media. And uh, I don't think anybody has it figured out, but it's, it's going to happen, and I think it's going to be uh, a, a major influence in the media environment that we um, are in the midst of. Just a word about YouTube. Um, you know, YouTube is, has had a significant impact, as several guests have uh, mentioned. And we talk about YouTube like we all grew up with it. And it's 24, 30 months old. And, you know, something comes across the horizon that fast and that big is, is, is really significant. So um, I'll leave it at that and open it up for questions. And it sold for $1.65 billion. Uh, Chancellor, I, I don't want to uh, put you on the spot. I, I want to just first uh, note my surprise that you're here and not at the Gunther concert. <laughs> uh, and invite you to, is there anything that you would like to, any comment that you'd like to share with us about uh, your thoughts on, on uh, UCTV and community media? Don't feel obligated, but we'd love to hear from you. I want, to, I want to thank the Carsey Wolf uh, Center for Film, Television, and New Media for sponsoring this. I also, also want to thank UCTV for co-sponsoring this. I also want to thank your wonderful moderation. And also, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, to, f to sponsor this evening's discussion. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Uh, after Arnold retires, running for governor will be the chancellor. Uh, do we have any questions for these folks here, or shall I just begin to grill them? Sure, meaning. Uh, the networks themselves have pointed out that the falling numbers that they're facing, they got a lot of money, uh, is causing them to, to move away from production of expensive programming. They'll be doing more game shows, uh, more reality shows, and, uh, and watching wallpaper uh, peel. You have an even greater challenge. You don't have a big budget at all, and you hope to be a, a worldwide news organization. So how does that affect uh, your production? And you've got to think about that very hard, yeah? Yeah. Um, um, first of all, uh, the most vivid example of how we are going to cut down in terms of the production of our content um, is being creative. Um, a, a good example is that uh, currently, we have an agreement with APTV, this is Associated Press TV, uh, that basically gives us a feed of about five to six hours of footage from around the world um, every six hours. And on any given night, uh, the average mainstream television network uses between 30 and 40 seconds of that footage. And, uh, and if you watch the footage, it is incredible. It, it, the, the content uh, in, in, you know, shot by local uh, television stations, uh, AP TV um, cameramen, and, and no one's actually using it. And we hope to take that footage uh, that is being made available to us uh, for $20,000 a year for the entire year, because we're a nonprofit. And, uh, and we plan to write our own st stories 
and we plan to interview local print journalists um, who have expertise in the region, in the country, uh, who knows the language, who knows the geography. So we, we are going to use local expertise to t give us the analysis, to give us the reports, uh, and, and uh, be able to put, shed light on that footage for us. So we are exploring the cheapest way to produce material. Um, we are going to be using um, uh, shot boxes, you know, setting up uh, basically internet uh, cameras um, in various uh, uh, local stations, community organizations, and so on, where journalists can actually report to us. So we're going to maximize the potential of uh, citizen journalism, local journalists who will, who will report to us. We'll be using, you know, radio journalists, uh, you know, again, who are, are, are very versed in what's going on locally to report to us. So we're looking at very creative ways of producing content that, are, that, are, that is inexpensive. And, and at the speed at which the internet is now working, you know, it's quite possible. Guy, can you elaborate on that in terms of what you're teaching your students? Um, no. <laughs> No, we're, we're, we're teaching um, students a vast array of digital media skills. And, the, and what's the cost basis that they're going to be dealing with when they get out in the real world? When you say the cost basis, you mean? How much does it cost to produce an hour of uh, programming? Well, that's the, that's the beauty of the new uh, uh, tools that are available, because with uh, uh, you know, digital media, you can produce high quality, Productions for a fraction of what we previously cost. So, people are. Uh, somebody actually uh, told me that there was a feature film that had been cut on iMovie, which is a free, uh, nonlinear system. It comes with every Macintosh. It sounds like an, I'm a Mac or a PC, but um, it's uh, the the cost of production has come way down. People are doing uh, much much more uh, robust kinds of productions with in, infinitely smaller budgets. So that's the world that we're are preparing our students for. Um, high definition cameras are now down to six, seven thousand uh, dollars. You know, Dan Gilmore has a cell phone that takes pretty nice quality uh, video. Uh, so it's just uh, it's a real, really new world in that regard. Uh, Allison Gang is also with UCTV, and uh, is the communications manager. Now, so far. This is one of the programs that's being produced for UCTV. So far, it's all long-form programs, but you have uh, aspirations to, to try some other things. Could you tell us about that? Well, um, what UCTV does, and the reason we've been, we're able to, to program a 24-hour channel, is because we, UCTV doesn't produce. We collect. We use the resources of the, the 10 campuses. Um, to send us the programming, which we package and disseminate on the satellite channel. Um, some of it, most of it is long form, and then some goes down to half hour type programs and magazine style. Um, we keep hearing as things are moving into the web, short, 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 attention spans are short. Um, and I think um, we've talked about long form programming still not being necessarily suitable for web viewing, and why television is a big um, outlet for us still. But um, we've talked with, um, whether it's healthcare providers or even um, folks in the California State Legislature that might be able to use our uh, UC professor's expertise um, to get information on maybe um, environmental issues um, that they're going to have to vote on in the leg legislature pretty soon. And that hour-long program is great, but they don't have the time to watch it. Um, and we know it's a need to, to make things in smaller pieces to put on the web. Um, that takes more production time. Um, and something that we're looking to want to be able to do um, and hopefully be able to um, ramp it up at our campuses so that they can have the editing capability and time to um, make those smaller pieces and get them to us that we can air and then, of course, put up, put up on the web. Now, one of the things we heard uh, earlier was that uh, UCTV right now is sort of top-down. Programs are produced. It's uh, people who have expertise, or it's faculty members, or so on. And then those are the programs that you put out for distribution to an audience. And as you know, that's sort of antithetical to the idea of the internet. And in the discussion today, you heard a lot of talk about how to engage a conversation, how UCTV can be part of that. Um, would would you and Lynn entertain the idea of, let's say, student videos 
that are, are pushed up to the web or, or videos from the community? It's, you know, one of the things we wanted to accomplish here, here today was to get input from other folks and think outside the box. And I think there's definitely room on the web for um, that two-way conversation. That's something the university has to be able to do. Um, I think it's, it's something we could, cons we, we would consider, of course. Um, and to be able to integrate that in, um, be able to build on the long-form content, which I think it's our base. I think that um, it's something that we're able to provide that mainstream media doesn't, is full, in-depth, thoughtful conversation about, about important issues. I want to keep that, and I think it's imperative, but um, to be able to um, add that, enhance it to the web, and, and, and be able to hear what people are saying back, whether it's user-submitted content or texting or conversations around a video on a web uh, interface, I think is absolutely essential. Hope we can grow there. Okay. Yeah, all, all of the uh, producers, all the major uh, studios are, have some initiative that's focused on mobile phone, and it's all short form. And Fox is producing what are called Mobisodes, one minute episodes for delivery. Uh, to mobile phones, and some of them are thinking about longer uh, series, all very, very uh, micro content. So, and that with with uh, YouTube, you know, the the form factor here is is pretty short. Uh, we're associated with uh, the Channel 17 and 21 locally here. They did something that was very simple. They put in a server-based uh, replay system, which means now they can take. Uh, content that's of any length that we're not married to 2830 anymore and uh, it could be as short as you, a minute or as long as you need it to be. So that's going to really change that whole uh, production. Martin, uh, the modestly sized AT&T uh, also owns Singular, so part of your strategy will be to mobile devices? Absolutely. Um, kind of our, our longer term vision is that we, uh, any content that we provide you, you'll be able to access through any of the screens, through your cell phone, through the internet, or through your, your television. And um, whether you get the content from us or whether it's content that you've gotten on your own uh, using your cell phone, uh, could potentially let you upload video from your phone into uh, a storage unit that we could host for you and then let you publish that to a YouTube or to a UCTV or share it with your friends or to your blog and so forth. So uh, the, the, you know, owning Singular is a huge asset as it is becoming more and more of a video device. Uh, do we have a question from the audience? I, I just, it's a question for you actually, if that's uh, permitted. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and it actually it reflects the conversation that's just sort of uh, taken place. You started out by saying that you were very concerned about the consolidation, the massive consolidation of power in the news media. And in reference to, you know, um, the power of AT&T to really succeed in achieving some horizontal and vertical integration across marketplace, uh, marketplaces, um, the power of, of, of actually Apple to do the same thing in an interesting way, the recent uh, announcement of the failed attempt to um, merge Microsoft and Yahoo. I mean, we're, see we're clearly seeing massive consolidation of power in this broad space which merges uh, information technologies and content. And to a certain extent, the platforms and the utilities will control the media in, in the future, even if the media producers and consumers are so distributed. Does that concern you in the same way that the consolidation of the news media did when you opened out? Yes, but I can only wrestle so many dragons at one time. Um, I am immediately concerned about, about how uh, content has been uh, distorted, has been slanted, and has been narrowed down so that we're not able to get nearly the breadth of information that we would like. So that's, that's an imperative and immediate concern. Uh, to the degree that a few corporations own all the, meth the, the distribution platforms, that's problematic. But that can also be regulated. So uh, the, the, if we were to lose net neutrality, I would be really, really concerned. Because then at that point, they would be able to dictate who has access, when they have access, how much they pay for access, and so on. But if you are able to guarantee access to everyone on an equal basis, and the cost basis for that access is, is not onerous, and thus allows small players to continue to emerge in the way that we have, it's a problem that I'm prepared to live with for now. 
Now, if that, if that begins to arise, then we, can, we have either regulatory uh, prescriptions that we can apply, or you can break them up, uh, because essentially that's a monopoly problem. But that's a very different problem than the people who uh, control the distribution of the content itself, who are distributing the content with uh, clear bias attached. Uh, it is, it's simply a fact that some of the people who work for these large organizations are a, a little constrained from going after some of the stories that they might otherwise because of the ownership. And the very large companies that do own these now small pieces of information uh, view them either as an annoyance because they don't make much money or because they, they tend to stir up too much trouble or as an opportunity to, to help them with, with Washington. And, and that is, is a real and immediate problem that we have to struggle with. I thank the panel for joining us. We, we uh, move now to our third panel. And this one goes directly to the heart of what we have been talking about uh, through all of this. As we talk about the cost of production, the means of production, the access to production, as we talk about the, the, the need to be a part of the community, it really comes down to, uh, to Tolstoy's question as he walked through, the, through the, the, the ghettos of Moscow, what then must we do? What do we do with this opportunity? What do we do with this challenge that is placed before the great uh, University of California system? So uh, as we look at the, the opportunities that exist, as we look at the barriers that have fallen, as we look at the falling cost of production, what are the implications for the non-commercial university and public media? And our panelists are, are well capable of answering this. If you'd introduce yourselves, please. I'm Dave Toole, uh, CEO of a company called Outthink Media. We run a <coughs> site called Our Media, which is a social network for digital media producers, where we provide education, community, and uh, software services to help people produce digital media. Uh, some examples, uh, one product was called Alive in Baghdad, which was filmed in the streets of Baghdad. It was distributed in Boston, edited in San Antonio, and published in New York. Uh, another example is a, a mashup for music, where there's music that was distributed. People created videos around the country. And this now is being connected to a broadcast network where they're doing media mashups and then uploading it to a website and to the broadcast network. So that's what we're focused on. And uh, we'll come back and talk about UCTV when we're through with the panel here. Uh, I'm Doc Searles. Um, I'm a research fellow with the uh, Center for Information Technology and Society uh, here at UCSB. Uh, I'm also a fellow with the Berkman Center at Harvard, like Dan Gilmore is as well. I've been a, a journalist for all my life. I uh, worked in the newspaper magazine business. I was in uh, broadcasting for a while. My nickname, Doc, is a fossil remnant of a former radio identity uh, that I had. Um, uh, currently, and for the last 10 years, actually, I've been uh, an editor with uh, Linux Journal and have been following the open source movement very closely. Uh, I co-wrote a book called The Clue Train Manifesto, which was a business bestseller about eight years ago and still sells well in nine languages, almost inexplicably because it was a rant, uh, but it, it's still out there. Um, and, and oddly, if you look me up on the net, what you'll find most um, references pointing to is my blog. I've been blogging since 1999. Uh, it's an eponymous blog. It's called Doc Searle's Web Blog. If you look up Doc, I'm sometimes the head of the Department of Commerce, which tells you the leverage that blogging has. Um, and uh, it actually is oddly the thing I put the least amount of effort into um, of all the above things. So that's sort of an irony to savor. I'm Jerry Roberts. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a journalist, a lifelong journalist as well. I worked for 30 years in daily newspapers, mostly uh, at the San Francisco Chronicle. And uh, these days I am uh, delighted and uh, privileged to be the publications director of the Daily Nexus here at UCSB, the student-run newspaper, um, at a time when the newspaper uh, industry is uh, kind of leading the way for old media in collapsing and uh, losing its business model. One of the few areas of newspapers that is really growing and doing well uh, are university and college newspapers. And uh, they are well positioned to, uh, I think, uh, evolve and transition into the next uh, phase. As uh, Guy referenced, uh, uh, old media don't go away. They just uh, tend to change. Um, 
college newspapers are produced by and used by uh, people who grew up on the internet, people who participate daily in uh, uh, online communities who use the word Facebook as a verb. Um, and they, uh, they provide hyper-local content uh, for a discrete community. So all of these things are tremendous assets, and I think uh, uh, papers like the Daily Nexus and other uh, university papers represent uh, great opportunity as laboratories for exploring multi-platforms and uh, 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 the digital world. So my name is Lynn Bernstein, and uh, I'm the director of UCTV and have spent uh, the better part of today listening to a lot of people talk about um, new directions in media. We are at the point now where we're moving past startup and thinking about what that means for us um, as, an, as an alternative voice. We've talked a lot about that today. We're not a CNN, but we'd like to be providing um, a depth and breadth of information that can come from something like a university system that the University of California represents and are trying to think about how we um, enhance what we do, how we change, um, what surrounds what we do. We are in a bit of straddling two worlds. Um, television, as, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, is still a way to get to a lot of people. It's not a technology that's new or unusual. We understand what that is. Um, when we talk about broadband internet, um, that excludes a lot of people, but increasingly it will include more and more people. Um, so we need to be moving in these directions without abandoning the, the audiences and the base that we've grown. So we're in an interesting place right now because the technology is changing quickly, um, yet the need for the, the depth of content is ever greater. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can or should abandon um, that kind of in-depth programming in favor of the short attention span sound bite because there are many places for short attention span um, sound bites, um, YouTube and many others, but there are not many places where you can listen to an in-depth conversation on issues that affect us profoundly. And that could be anything from global warming to who our next president might be or to how we educate our children. And that's all very crucial information and very crucial conversations that we need to be having and I think that may be the, the key to where we need to be going is thinking about these um, perhaps more as conversations and less as monologues. Um, the, all conversations can sometimes start with a monologue um, and that does give us a base um, um, upon which we can grow the conversation and so we can start with a, a, a common um, understanding of a problem and then be able to discuss it. One of the other things that we've gotten a lot about today is thinking not of audiences as individuals, but as groups of communities. Um, and when we think about them that way, it becomes a little less daunting to think about how communities may interact, because now we're not talking about 50 billion people interacting. <laughs> we're talking about these communities that, that can be identified or can be, um, in, in some sense, um, um, reached in a way that we may not be able to reach every single person, but we may be able to target in a, in a different way and then provide some sort of a feedback mechanism so that rather than top down, I'm not sure that's quite right. Um, I think it's more from inside out or outside in. And I, so I, I think it's, it's a little flatter, a little more horizontal than top down, but the notion that the, there needs to be something coming back in as well as something going out. Um, and I think that's key, and I think that's where techno technology will allow us to do that in a way that we haven't been able to do it before. Um, and as the technology grows and as the access to that technology grows, we need to be there um, pushing that along so that we are in that space um, as it's becoming available, as people are having access to it, as we have a broadband connection in our homes, in our schools, in our health centers, so that that kind of interchange and exchange of information can happen. Do we have a question? Well, let me ask. Yes, ma'am. Yes, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the fact that every day, uh, the exact amount of news, you know, happen in the world that would fit a newspaper. Uh, that, you know, never cease to amaze me. But what worries me now, I mean, it's, is, is that obviously that is not true. I mean, we are very selective about what we print in newspapers, but um, I'm, I'm worried about 
the fact that we're all becoming monads of news. I mean, we are pre-selecting news on a very narrow basis, and we are kind of reading parallel, you know, we, we live parallel existences in terms of what kind of news we're exposed to, because we pre-choose them according to what we want to hear, and according to the slant that we want to hear, and, and according to what we want to already confirm. So that is, that is my concern about the news on... on, on uh, Let me see if I understand. You're saying you're concerned that if people get to select what they want to see and hear, they will they will narrow down what they pay attention to rather than the newspaper. It, it? Well, r rather that that the newspapers at least, or you know, the news gives you some kind of exposure to uh, kind of a broader content. Of course, not as broad as I used to think, uh, but at least it gives you some exposure to news that you may or may not have selected before. Anybody want to deal with that, Dave? No. I'm not qualified to deal with that. Okay, all right. Anybody? <laughs> um, well, one thing I'm struck by the fact that Jerry Seinfeld had that same memory uh, as a child of noticing that there was only enough news to fill up the paper. But that, that aside, um, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a good point, and I think people use the internet the way that they're going to use the internet. Uh, a lot of people use it to reinforce positions that they already hold. And you know the great thing about the internet is you never have to read anything again that you disagree with. Um, but it's also an opportunity for people to read much more widely. And uh, um, uh, Forrest was uh, uh, talking earlier about how he had uh, uh, gone online uh, about uh, uh, Iraq and how he was able to get much more pure information and direct information off the, off the web than he was during a trip there because he could read blogs from soldiers, he could read blogs from citizens and so on and so forth and, and get exposed to people who he would uh, probably not be able to have access to were he there reporting the story. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think he's right that there is a certain market mechanism that is built into to the web and, and, you know, best things will rise to the top and people will use it for whatever purposes they, they, they will use it, and one of those will be to reinforce the beliefs and, and prejudices that they may in, already in hold. In addition, I, I tend to find the behavior is, is not what you expect. It's sort of counterintuitive to that. If you go to Dig or uh, Delicious or some of the bookmark sites, people seem to want to explore, uh, or at least a lot of them do. So there's something about the internet that causes people to want to wander around rather than just pay attention to a single thing. This gentleman wants to ask a question. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a comment about um, what you were saying just a minute ago. An example of the, the good rising to the top, I think, would be a popular video blogger named Zay Frank, who did um, a show for a year. And it started out pretty rough, but you could tell that the guy had some talent. He's a and, comedian who's on the web. Yes. And he, he's involved with uh, producing a lot of content and has been for a, for a while. Um, but the show grew to um, having well over 100,000 subscribers, which is pretty good for a video blog. Um, and now it's over, but there's so much, there's so many video blogs out there that, uh, and a lot of them really are, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to watch them. And this one I watched every day. Um, so, and also, I trusted it as a news source because this guy, he's not a citizen reporter. He's just some talented guy with interesting opinions. So this goes back to what Doc was saying. And actually, Doc, you're on my Flickr photo stream. I've never um, met you, but I'm a programmer, and I knew that you were the editor of Linux Journal. So, and you're in Santa Barbara, so I thought, sure, I'll add him as a contact. So it's kind of interesting because I know when you fly, I see that you take pictures from the plane. Not just a few, I have 14,000 some pictures. Mm -hmm. A lot of sunset pictures, pictures too. A an interesting fact, that this is, uh, I brought this up earlier. Um, I'm flying back from Europe this last week. Um, my son, who's 10 years old, and I stood in the back of a 777 uh, um, shooting pictures out of the two windows they hardly ever use next to the galleys where the where the uh, flight attendants sit, and so they're ones that are not very scratched up, they're really quite clear. And took a lot of pictures of, of, of uh, Scotland and Greenland 
Three of the pictures of Scotland are now the examples of those islands on Wikipedia. Um, because of the licensing that I used on it, I didn't even know I was using. Um, even to the degree that their debates broke out on whether or not there was a lock on one of those islands in the Outer Hebrides. Uh, and in the Greenland case, uh, I, I understand that some of the pictures that I took are, are now documentary evidence in the, in the photo libraries that some scientific obsessives are maintaining concerning the melting of Greenland. Um, and th they're time stamped, they're part of science, which is an amazing thing to me. And it's entirely passive on my part, but it's, a, it's remarkable. I'm just amazed by it. I'd, yeah. I'd like to comment on your bringing Zay Frank up, because I, I think there's some subtleties around what he produced that's important in the conversation about UCTV. He built an interactive community. So it wasn't just part of his show if you went to his blog. There was a way to engage in the blog around the subject matter to connect to other people around that subject matter. And I, I've spent the last two years hanging with the video blogging community. And to the point about the journalists learning their stuff, if you watch the video blogging community, here are people who, some are professional producers. A, a guy who works for me was a producer at CNN. And, and they're learning this short form craft. They're learning as importantly the community building that surrounds that and the shared interest that people have around that. And I think that's something that shouldn't be discounted because that's growing at such a rapid rate and that's gonna be the next phase after blogging is gonna be video blogging which is gonna extend to the community building that lives around it. So I'm glad you brought that up. We have time. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, just really quick. It is, it is all about the content and your trust network. Um, why, why I told, I brought that up about you being in my uh, Flickr photo stream is because, because of your credentials, I, I care about your pictures for some reason and that you're local to this community. I think that's kind of important though because I don't, my, my view of news and gathering news is, is pretty narrow but I rely on all my friends and my, my network to keep me up to date. And I think it works actually pretty well. Thanks. We have time for one last question, sir. I didn't know that I have the last question. Um, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> but uh, I have a comment to make, and then I, I have a question for the panel. I'm going to try to piggyback on the female panelists. And the lady who was talking about the, uh, I think it was the uh, Verizon, representative. Um, I struggle with the issue of, of being able to trust digital versus traditional news media. Um, but what came to my mind, I was thinking about you and communities and target, you know, how you have to target different groups of people. Just like in this room, we have so many di different representations. So when the uh, student came up, to the uh, mic earlier and said that he did not look at TV and look at the news on TV. I can relate to that because I have two sons his age who don't look at TV for the news. But I tape all three news programs morning, noon, and night. And it has, you know, has something to do with generational. But um, I, wanna, I wanna ask the question about, um, uh, about the media, whether it's traditional a digital as it relates to race and to class. And I'm gonna do it by way of example. Um, two years ago, we all experienced the nightmare of Katrina in New Orleans. And that in and of itself was enough to, you know, to make all of us pretty unhappy around the world. But some of you may or may not know that a few days after that on the internet, uh, there was this, there was this um, picture that was circulating through the African American community, throughout America. And what the picture showed, it, and it said, what's wrong with this picture? And what the picture showed was um, one photograph of a bunch of little African American kids who were being taken away from the floods, and they were in the back of a pickup truck. And then they had another photo right next to it, and it was all of the dogs that were being rescued, and they had them in this air-conditioned bus being taken away. 
And the, the question that I have is, number one, I don't know whether to trust that. I don't know whether that was a, um, a, a citizen reporter or a traditional news media who, who produced this in the first place, but it circulated throughout the African American community and had an impact. Um, and so my question is, my question is, whether, whether it's traditional or digital, do you, do you think that digital would make a difference, I guess is, is my question. I, I, I'll take that quickly. Uh, I think you have a better chance of getting to the bottom of that and finding the answer to that question in the digital world than you will in the, in the older analog world. Um, I don't know how many times, countless times, um, uh, a, a particular picture will run and get debunked on the net. Um, but there's, uh, I, I can tell you if you, even if you don't have a blog, if you have some public forum where you could ask that question, if you contact a blogger like myself or an, any number of other people, would be glad to help out with that. Point to the pictures, show them, I guarantee you're gonna get people digging into that thing and getting to the bottom of it. Anybody else wanna take that? The other thing I'd say is, you know, don't trust much. Or as Reagan said, trust but verify. What he's saying is right. If you, if you have any questions, you can, you can keep looking and, and, and those questions will get answered. Uh, we, we come to the end and Len, so much of this has been about UCTV, I'd like to give you the last word. Wow. Um, well, my last word would be thank you all for um, helping me and helping all of us involved in this endeavor. Um, think very creatively about where we go as we um, think about different ways of expanding what we're doing and bringing value to um, not only California but the country with the great work that's coming out of the university. Um, so part of that is just that it really is helpful to stand back and, and listen and have ideas that we bounce around be validated. Um, because it's easy to get into a bubble and not always be talking to other people about what makes good sense. And a lot of what we've heard today are things that we've thought long and hard about, things that we need to do, we want to do, and our challenges will be to figure out how to do them um, and how to straddle these worlds um, as we figure which world we end up in, or maybe we will always end up in this duality world where there, there are different ways of accessing media. There won't be any one way. Um, you know, 50 years ago, it was the TV or the radio that, that was your, and the newspaper, that was your choice. Now we talk about all these other ways of getting information. Um, and we hope that we can continue to, to play our part in um, making the work that go, the wonderful work that goes on at the university accessible to as many people in as many communities in as many ways as possible. Well, to the panelists who were so kind to share their time uh, at, with no compensation and, and had such wonderful ideas to Ron and Connie and the terrific staff that put this together, to the folks who helped tape this, and to all of you who came tonight and shared your thoughts, we offer our thanks and good night. Thank you.